So we've seen the gold fields, the dipping hard rock going thousands of meters below the surface. We've seen the dome, which suggests that those same strata once projected at least a thousand meters above the present ground surface. And we've seen that it's been chopped off. But now there's a, an added complexity. You may have noticed from the photographs that I've shown you just now that the plane is not just a plane. Incised into the plane are gently undulating valleys and hills. The top of the hills never going above that critical 1,700 to 1,800 meters above sea level. How did that happen? In the section that follows, I'm going to evidence to you that that can only have been f the result of a massive hydraulic drainage event that scoured out rock in huge quantities at huge velocities beyond anything that we can comprehend because it is so, from an engineering point of view, the dramatic catastrophic change happens in very short spaces of time with huge forces, not gradually over millions or hundreds of millions of years. Let's have a look at what the remaining surface of the dome actually evidences. In front of you, you have a computer-generated digital terrain model of the surface of the Witwatersrand. In the north, you see to the top of the picture, you see the Michalisberg uh, with the cliffs facing south. And to the south, you have the ridges of the Witwatersrand. What you will notice is that not only have we got the level surface on the horizon that we saw previously, but interspersed with that, the valleys that have been cut into that level surface. Here we have a river valley in the halfway house granite dome and what you will notice is that it is a very, very flat valley and that the stream in the middle is very small. Going to Craig Hall, we see the same phenomenon. I grew up uh, less than a kilometer from this point and I've seen the river in flood many times but very seldom does it go above the immediate banks that you see uh, in the center of, the, of the, the picture. Very seldom does it flood the electricity pylons. There is absolutely no way that that little stream could have eroded this huge valley. We find that these streams do not even have the capacity to erode the rocks in the riverbed. On the left we see a, a photograph of an erosion channel which shows how a narrow flow of water cuts a deep narrow gorge, not a big wide valley. It's important to recognize that gentle rain does nothing to the topography. It just waters the plants. We could run those sprinklers for millions of years and all we would have would be lush foliage. It is high velocity water that erodes material. We can see there the amount of material removed very quickly with that high pressure water jet. On the right we see an example of hydraulic mining. Very high pressure water used to very rapidly cut down and erode huge volumes of material. High velocity water has enormous capacity to cut and transport material. We then find ourselves with some other interesting phenomenon. If we get up close to Northcliffe or the Michalisberg, we find these near vertical cliff faces in hard, intensely hard rock, with huge chunks of rock just plucked out of those cliff faces, leaving ragged edges on the cliff face. What forces were required to pluck those rocks out and where have the rocks gone to? We're looking at huge volumes of material here. To complicate matters even further, when we get on top of the hills, we find huge chunks of jagged, sharp rock just left behind. Presumably the rock in between has gone somewhere. They're a continuation of the strata. 
If we travel to Cape Town, we find the same phenomenon, a near vertical cliff face with massive chunks of rock plucked out and on top of the mountain. Huge chunks of rugged, ragged rock left behind by something. How do we explain this? If we look at Northcliffe, we find a drop of 300 meters vertically over three kilometers. If we look at the entire halfway house granite dome, at a rough estimate, about 600 cubic kilometers of rock and earth have been removed. That's 600,000 million cubic meters. The river flow is downhill all the way to the low ground of the Limpopo province, about a thousand kilometers. And all that material was removed through the Port Gorge. The only possible explanation is massive high velocity water flows as being the mechanical means to move this material. If we look at the flow characteristics and the erosion characteristics of stream flows, we find that it is exponential and that the faster the flow of water, the greater the capacity. What happens at high velocities beyond anything we've ever experienced on Earth? Looking there, we see the path that the material has to have followed out through the Port Gorge all the way down to the low felt of Limpopo and possibly into the Mozambique Channel. A huge distance through one gorge. It's the only possible explanation as to where all this material has gone to. Somebody said to me, could this have been caused by glacier action? The answer is no. On the bottom right we see the valleys in the area we're talking about. On the top right we see a valley caused by a glacier similar to that on the left. Glaciers are characterized by U-shaped valleys, very different from what we have here. Okay. We clearly see here that water evaporates and rock doesn't. And I suggest for your consideration that your whole life experience tells you that rock does not evaporate. It is so that if you subjected rock to such high temperatures that it became molten, it might sublimate at some level, it's, uh, but in general, rock does not evaporate. Could the rock have dissolved? Well, you clearly see from that example, sugar dissolves. But rock doesn't. Your whole life experience will tell you that you do not expect rock to dissolve. If we look at the erosion of valleys, if there's a limited bed road load, the result will be a narrow valley with steep sides, as you see on the right. In order to produce the wide, flat valleys that we see in the Vidvatisrand area, it's necessary for there to have been a large bed load, as demonstrated in the diagram at the bottom. It's a huge problem to explain. The rock was not removed by ice, it didn't evaporate, it did not dissolve. It can only have been eroded by massive water suction resulting from high velocity, and I suggest for your consideration, coupled with boiling water, as the only way that we can get these ragged hilltops. How could all of this happen? How could we get the volumes of water? Well, it so happens that there's a large body of information which indicates that all the continents once fitted together. Conventional theory says that they separated over millions or billions of years. But what if it happened rapidly, like all the other events discussed in this presentation? Continental separation requires massive forces to split the continents, massive forces to overcome the inertia of these massive continents and start movement, and then massive forces to stop the movement. This cannot happen in a steady state environment. It requires an external force. Imagine rapid separation of the continents. What if simultaneously the Earth expanded as a consequence of all the surface disruption breaking the crust, which would have contrast, contracted rapidly as a consequence of rapid cooling? What if several kilometers depth of water drained off the land in a very short space of time, perhaps days or weeks? 
What if the water flow had the erosive capacity to cause the topography that I've described and the topography in the part of the world where you live? What if? Some theories. The conventional theory is that thermal convection of the Earth's core slowly over millions of years separated the continents. But what about the possibility of impact by a large object from space causing instability or flyby of a large comet, a near miss? What about contraction of the crust causing cracking or a combination of some of the above? If we look at the coefficient of thermal expansion, the ratio of change in length to length as a result of a change in temperature, we find that the coefficient of thermal expansion of granite is 6.5 micrometers per meter. That's millionths of a meter per meter at 20 degrees centigrade. The melting point of granite, as in the Hofwehas granite dome, is 1,700 degrees centigrade. Cooling from molten to zero degrees would shrink the circumference of the Earth by approximately 427 kilometers. Now, it is so that the whole Earth was not molten, but even a much smaller cooling would cause massive tension on the surface of the Earth because the core would not contract. So the possible source of the forces to split apart the continents is there. As the continents separate, we would see massive gorges forming and potentially water rushing off the continents, giving rise to massive erosion beyond anything we can visualize. Then we find that there are ocean trenches. The Mariana Trench near Japan is 11,000 meters deep. Seemingly concurrently with the continental separation, trenches were formed, which would provide a f further vehicle for draining of the continents. It is so that the volume of the seas is 18 times more than the volume of the land, so it is easy to postulate rapid and dramatic drainage. Well, let's remember that we live in an unstable universe. Remember the example of the runaway star capable of traveling from the Earth to the moon in one hour. What if something like that was to fly by the Earth, putting massive gravitational forces on the Earth? There are theories that the Earth's axis was once vertical, that the orbit around the sun was circular and not elliptical, that a year was exactly 360 days instead of 365 and a quarter. And it seems absolutely possible that a large comet or other space object that exerted massive gravitational pull on the Earth could pull the Earth out of a circular orbit around the Sun and cause the Earth to tilt on its axis. One theory says close to 30 degrees originally. Why not? So we find large valleys incised in the dome and elsewhere all over the Earth. We see, like Table Mountain, the ends just disappeared. These valleys are too large to be formed by current streams. We find massive plucking of cliff faces and tops of hills all over the world. We see that the continents were originally one landmass. We see that thermal shrinkage of the crust due to cooling quite easily explains the splitting up of the continents. And we see that a massive flyby or impact of a space object tilting the Earth on its axis, thereby distorting its orbit around the Sun and causing massive shear hysteresis between the crust and the core can explain the separation of the continents. All of this happened rapidly. It's mechanically impossible for it to happen slowly. How long ago did this happen? <laughs>